Hey, welcome to Family Church Online. I'm so glad you've tuned in wherever you're watching from as we look at what the Bible has to say about the power of our words. Yep, I want to talk about the power of words. I've titled this message today, Jaws of Life, because when firefighters show up to the scene of a collision, a car accident that is so disastrous that the passengers are trapped inside the vehicle, they'll often use a tool that was invented in 1972 called the Jaws of Life. And one of the inventors, his name is Mike Brick, he gave it that nickname, Jaws of Life, because it had the ability to save people from the jaws of death. And there's a picture that is going to pop up right now. How many of you know, though, we've, we've got some jaws, too, on us that can be used as jaws of life or jaws of death. Did you know that on average, we speak about 16,000 words per day? And some of you use more than that, and you know who you are. Check this out. If you live to be 90 years old, we will have spent about 525,600,000 words in our lifetime. That's a lot of words which basically means we have a lot of opportunities to royally slip up and say the wrong thing, and you bet we do. And more often than I'd like to admit, I've got jaws of death rather than jaws of life. And instead of giving life with my words, I tend to trap and tear down, and it's just human nature. We're sinful beings, and these tongues are powerful. The power of our words make me think about tattoos also. And I'm not against tattoos, um, but I just don't want to be poked with a needle. There are some people who have made some very impulsive decisions, though, in tattoo parlors, and, and now they're desperate to get rid of them or to get them fixed. If you've ever watched any of the tattoo reality shows, you know that this is true. And here's a few of my favorites that are, you're going to see right now. One that is uh, it's supposed to say no regrets, but instead it's misspelled no regrets. I wonder if this person has any regrets about getting this tattoo. Or how about this one? Only God can juge me. It's missing a D. Only God can juge me. How about this last one? Don't let the past make your decisions for today. Oh, man, one simple error in the spelling of decisions. Sometimes people go into a tattoo parlor and they make an impulsive decision, a careless decision, and then they're stuck with it. And some people, even if they go through the painful process of try, trying to have it removed, um, it's faded but the words are still there. They never really go away. And I wanna use that as kind of a metaphor to help us understand the power of our words because our words may not be tattooed on someone else's skin, but that doesn't mean our words are not tattooed on their soul. And you've heard the phrase, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Yeah, we found out that was a lie too because broken bones will heal, but sometimes the wounds from painful words linger for a lot, whole lot longer. And so our key verse today is found in the book of Proverbs, the book of wisdom, chapter 18, verse 21, which says this, the tongue has the power of life and death. The tongue has the power of life and death. Words have astonishing power to bless or to curse. You can build up or you can tear down with your words. You can encourage or destroy. You can bring life or bring death. These jaws can be jaws of life or jaws of death. And each of us are the product of the words that have been spoken into our lives that have been tattooed onto our souls. You're a product of the words spoken in your life. You're looking at a guy right now who is the sum total of the words spoken into his life. And I've been enormously blessed with life-giving words throughout my life. I've had amazing parents in my life who told me that they love me and they believed in me. Their prayers, their encouragement, their words of affirmation have played a, a bigger role in my life and in my family than any of you will ever know. I grew up in the church with leaders and ministry volunteers who believed in me and spoke life into me. God's really going to use your life, Matt. And I'm so thankful for the people who have spoken words of life into me and saw the potential in me that I didn't see myself. And I know some of you are saying, but I never had that. That's not fair. You're, you're just sheltered, Matt. And I'm just going to tell you, well, maybe you're right. But I also know that Jesus can heal that wound in your life. And I, I can't wait to show you through Scripture how valuable you really are. And just to show you how deep this principle goes, that the tongue has the power of life and death, it's rooted in Scripture. In fact, when God creates the world, all the way back in the book of Genesis chapter 1, he doesn't pull out his Stanley tool set and his tape measure. He uses words as his tool of creation. In the third verse of the Bible, God took a situation that was formless and void, 
darkness was covering the face of the earth, and he opened his mouth. And in Genesis chapter 1, verse 3, it says, And God said, Let there be light. With his words, he creates the world. God uses words to bring light and life. God uses words to create and build up. When God speaks, the lights come on. But then just two chapters later, we read a very different use of words in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. It says this, Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? So Satan uses words as well. And he uses words to destroy. He uses words to confuse. And, he'll, and here's what's interesting. The serpent's words weren't even true. That's not what God said, but that didn't keep his words from having power. The Bible tells us this about our spiritual enemy in John chapter 8, verse 44, talking about Satan, the devil. He was a murderer from the beginning. He has always hated the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, it is consistent with his character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. That's his nickname, the father of lies. And so many of you, you have words tattooed on your soul that aren't even true. They're lies, but they have so much power. Life and death are in the power of our tongue. Words are powerful. In the New Testament of the Bible, in the Gospel of John, the book of John, John, is, of course, is an eyewitness to the life of Jesus. He's watching this life happen, and he introduces Jesus in the book of John, and he doesn't refer to Jesus as Jesus. He doesn't refer to him as the Messiah. He calls him the Word. John chapter 1, it says this, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And so in Genesis chapter 1, God speaks light into the darkness. And then in John chapter 1, Jesus is introduced as the word that's coming to bring light into the darkness. And then throughout the ministry of Jesus on earth, he constantly uses words to flip the script. He calms a raging storm with the words, peace, be still, and the sea comes to a calm. He uses words to proclaim the good news to the poor, to proclaim freedom for prisoners, to restore sight to the blind, to set the oppressed free. He uses words to raise Lazarus from the dead. He didn't go into that tomb and like bop him on the forehead. And, but instead, he uses words and he says, Lazarus, come out. And Lazarus comes out of that old grave. Words are the tool that Jesus use, uses to bring life where there is death, to bring light where there is darkness. And check this out. You and I are made in the image of God, and our words are a much more powerful tool than most of us ever realize. They leave a permanent tattoo on the soul and have the remarkable power of life and death to build up or to tear down, to bless and to curse, to rescue or destroy. And so with the time that remains, I just want to get real practical, and I have three thoughts I want to share with you on how to have jaws of life, how to have jaws of life, how to speak life in your family, with your friends, with the people that you work with, your kids, and in your marriage, how to talk to people. Your tone and your spirit matter. Maybe you'll just want to jot these down. Here's the first one. Number one is this. A little encouragement goes a long way. A little encouragement goes a long way. This is all about words of affirmation. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29 in the Bible says this, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up, and I underline that part, for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. So tell people you work with what a great job they're doing and how well they handle certain situations. Don't forget to tell your wife how much you love her and what she means to you. Tell your husband you're proud of him. You respect him. He's doing good. Tell your daughter she's the most beautiful girl in the world. Tell your son you're cool, dude. Tell your friends how much they matter to God. Shoot people unexpected notes from time to time saying, hey, just thinking about you. How's your day going? I'm so glad you're in my life. Man, I'm so proud of you. I'd marry you all over again. You're my dream come true. Wow, you're good at that. Thank you for being you. There's no one like you. If you think something nice, 
Say it. You know, a number of years ago, there was an evangelist named Bill Glass, and he had a prison ministry, and he asked a group of about, of about 1,000 prison inmates, he said, how many of you had parents who told you that one day you'd end up in prison? And he said that nearly every one of the inmates raised his hand. The tongue has the power of life and death, and a little encouragement goes a long way. Here's number two. If you want jaws of life, speak the truth in love. You know, sometimes you can't ignore difficult conversations. You got to have them. You actually have to talk about what's wrong sometimes, what's broken, what's not working. You have to talk about those sorts of things that are difficult to talk about, but there's a way to do it. You don't just say it in a way that is condescending or intimidates or frightens or damages the other person. You don't throw things. You don't raise your voice, even though sometimes we do, but we're not, we shouldn't. Think about the last family fight that you had with whoever it was. Maybe it was a couple weeks ago. Maybe it was several days, days ago. Maybe it was on the way to church. You ever notice how easy it is to get in fights on the way to church? My wife and I solved that years ago. We go in separate cars now, and it's really helped our marriage. But have you really changed somebody by raising your voice and intimidating them? Maybe you said, well, when I just zing that one-liner, when I called her that name, when I told him where he could put it, the problem just went away. Has that ever worked for you? Of course not. This is why the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15, it says, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ. It's amazing what you can say and how it will be received when you speak the truth, but you do it in love. So much of our communication is just tone of voice. For example, when someone says to you, especially if you're from the South, you've heard this phrase, bless your heart. Oh, bless your heart. That's actually not a positive thing. It's actually a very negative thing. Anytime someone says, bless your heart, what they're really saying is, you're an idiot. <laughs> but you can't tell because their tone of voice is so sweet. It's the truth in love. Oh, bless your heart. Max Lucado once said this. He said, tone matters. It matters in a nation. It matters in a home. And it matters in the church. When we don't agree, we must do so in love. Words can wound. Comments have consequences. And the Bible also says this in John chapter 1, verse 14. It says, The Word became flesh, speaking of Jesus, and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. That's how Jesus came. He came full of grace and truth. Jesus always spoke the truth in love. So I want to tell you about a story where you could sense the grace in his tone. The woman at the well. In John chapter 4, we find a woman. We don't know what her name was. She's just described as the woman at the well. She lived in the city of Samaria, so she's often called the Samaritan woman. And she was a social outcast because she lived in an immoral life. She was a pretty risque girl, had a reputation as a party animal, and who knows what her upbringing was like. That probably played a big role in the way she flaunted herself, and she had been married and divorced five times and was living with a guy now that was not her husband, and that was definitely not socially acceptable back in that day, especially. And she didn't place a high value on her life. She didn't know her worth, and she would go draw water from the town well, just like everyone else. Except she, she, she would go in the, the heat of the day around noon. Normally, the ladies would go and get water in the early part of the day, and they would catch up on the town gossip. They would hang out for a little bit, but she was not welcome. She was ostracized. She was rejected. They didn't want her around. And so she comes to the well around noontime to get some water when no one else is there, and it's strategic. And I'm sure in her day, she was an attractive girl, but years have passed now and the beauty is starting to fade and she's been through a bunch of men and life has taken a toll on her and she's tired and she's trying to fill the void with what kind of human relationship can fill that empty hole in her life and she was on the search for love and little did she know that on this particular day that her life was going to change radically because sitting at that well was God in human form the word Jesus Christ was waiting at that well, and she had an appointment with God. 
And so we pick up the story in John chapter 4, and here is a long passage of Scripture. I want to read you this story. It says, Soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Please give me a drink. He was alone at the time because his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. And the woman was surprised, for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. There was a racial tension going on. And she said to Jesus, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? And Jesus replied, If you only knew the gift God has for you and who you are speaking to, you would ask me, and I would give you living water. But sir, you don't have a rope or a bucket, she said, and this well is very deep. Where would you get this living water? She's kind of being sarcastic too. And besides, do you think you're greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us this well? How can you offer better water than he and his sons and his animals enjoyed? And Jesus replied in verse 13, anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again. But those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh, bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. Please, sir, the woman said, give me this water. Then I'll never be thirsty again, and I won't have to come here to get water. Go and get your husband, Jesus told her. I don't have a husband, the woman replied. And Jesus said, you're right. You don't have a husband, for you've had five husbands, and you aren't even married to the man you're living with now. You certainly spoke the truth, sir, the woman said. You must be a prophet. And then in verse 26, then Jesus told her, I am the Messiah. Just then his disciples came back. They were shocked to find him talking to a woman, but none of them had the nerve to ask, what do you want with her? Or why are you talking to her? The woman left her water jar beside the well and ran back to the village telling everyone, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could he possibly be the Messiah? What was Jesus doing in this story? Well, he exposed her sin. I mean, just exposed her. But then he gave her a solution. And he wasn't being mean, but he was speaking the truth and love. If you can catch the spirit of the conversation, he says, go and get your husband, Jesus told her. And she said, I don't have a husband. And Jesus basically says, bless your heart. (laughs) You sure don't. You've had five and the one you're living with now is not your husband. He told her the truth and then he poured out grace and mercy She was so used to being torn down and condemned. But as a result of that conversation, this woman turned from that old life and turned from her sin. You know, tone and spirit really matter in a conversation. You see, truth without grace is mean, and grace without truth is meaningless. But truth with grace, well, that's good medicine to the soul. And so here's the third thought if you want Jaws of Life. Number three, if you can't say something life-giving, don't say anything at all. You say, Matt, well, that's just, that all just sounds so lovey-dovey and ooey-gooey. I'm not like that. I I just say it like it is. I'm I'm a straight shooter. And if people don't like it, well, then fooey. Well, you know, the Proverbs chapter 15, verse 28 says, says this, the heart of the godly thinks carefully before speaking. Better yet, here's some good advice when you have nothing life-giving to say. You might want to make this your life verse. In Proverbs chapter 21, verse 23, it says, Watch your tongue and keep your mouth shut, and you will stay out of trouble. I mean, that'll help a lot of people right there. There's an old story of a woman in England who went to the pastor in the small little village where she lived because her conscience was troubled. And the priest knew her to be a habitual gossip. She had slandered nearly everyone in that little village. How can I make amends, she pleaded. And the pastor said, well, if you want to make peace with your conscience, take a bag of goose feathers and drop one on the porch of each one you have slandered. And when she had done so, she came back to the pastor and said, is that all? No, said the wise old minister. You must go now and gather up every feather and bring them all back to me. After a long time, the woman returned without a single feather. The wind has blown them all away, she said. My good woman, said the pastor, So it is with gossip. Unkind words are easily dropped, but we can never take them back again. And then James, the half-brother of Jesus, said this, We can make a large horse go wherever we want by means of a small bit in its mouth. And a small rudder makes a huge ship turn wherever the pilot chooses to go. Even though the winds are strong, 
In the same way, the tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches, but a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire. And so if you show me a marriage that is struggling, I can guarantee you what we'll see will be a lot of life-taking words, not a lot of life-giving words. On the other hand, you, you show me a marriage that's doing well, and I promise you, you'll see an abundance of life-giving words, two people with jaws of life. You take somebody that you don't like to be around. They make you feel small and unimportant. You've had a boss that drives you crazy. What you'll find is an abundance of life-taking words. On the other hand, there's someone that you love to be around, and they build you up. What you're going to see is plenty of life-giving words. Proverbs chapter 15, verse 4 says, The soothing tongue is a tree of life, but a perverse tongue crushes the spirit. So you can be a fault finder, which is quite honestly what most people are because that's our sin nature. We tend to look at what's wrong before we find what's right. And it's easy to be a fault finder. I don't like the way you walk. I don't like the way you chew. I don't like the jokes you tell. I don't like the way you snore. I don't like the way you breathe. And you can go into the office. I don't like the way she runs her meetings. Can you believe the way they raise their kids? I mean, they're gonna raise kids like that. They might as well put them in prison right now because those kids don't stand a chance. Whatever it is, it's so easy to find faults or you can be a hope dealer. You know, just offering hope. The Bible says this in Proverbs chapter 16, verse 24. It says, kind words are like honey, sweet to the soul and healthy for the body. I don't know how many of you have had your spirit crushed by life taking words. I guarantee almost everybody has at some point. Did you mean to do your hair like that? Oh, you don't like it? I mean, I just got it done. I paid a lot of money for that. Why aren't you married at this age in your life? And they hurt you. Or it could be something much more intentional, like, I can't stand you. I, I found someone else. Life crushing words. I never loved you anyway. You're pathetic. I wish I never had you. Our words are like toothpaste. Once the words leave your mouth, you can't take them back. I'll close with this final story about a man named John Newton before we pray. This man named, his name was John Newton. He was born in 1725 and John was a mess. And he worked on a ship and he was, a, he was hated by all of his shipmates. It's a true story. He was so wild, a raging drunk. He was violent, he was mean. His nickname, believe it or not, was the Great Blasphemer. In fact, his captain said, and I quote, not only did he use the worst language I've ever heard, but he created new words that exceeded the limits of verbal debauchery. John was so disliked, the Great Blasphemer, that one time when he actually fell overboard the ship, his crewmates didn't throw him a life preserve, instead they threw harpoons at the guy. He was so arrogant, so rebellious that his captain one time uh, he couldn't take it anymore and had the great blasphemer stripped down naked and flogged eight dozen times in front of 350 men. And that's when John decided, well, he, he's going to murder the captain and then take his own life. But before he could execute his plan, a big storm blew up on the ocean, hitting the ship. Everyone thought they were going to die. He thought his life was over, prepared to drown. The storm was so severe that he called out to God for mercy crying out to the same God he was so good at blaspheming. And it was this moment that marked his spiritual conversion. When he survived and they got back home, he ended that old life and began studying Christian theology and later became an abolitionist. And so this man named John Newton was transformed by the grace of God. And he put pen to paper and wrote the lyrics in seven, in, in, back in that day to a hymn that we now know as Amazing grace, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. And I love those lyrics, amazing grace, how sweet the sound. God's grace is so amazing. It's sweet to the soul. Words are powerful. If you're listening today and at this moment, maybe you've come to recognize that there's something missing in your life and you're desperate for something more. Let me tell you what it is. You're desperate for a God who loves you. In fact, his mercies are new every morning and his grace is so sweet and so good. He's a good God. And in one moment, one prayer, one savior can change everything. The Bible says when you call on the name that is above every other name, the name of Jesus, he, 
He hears your prayers, He forgives your sins, and you're made right with God, not by your good works, but by His grace. And I'd love to lead you in a prayer for those who would say, I need God's grace. I, I want to turn from my sins and give Him my life today. Make this your prayer right now. Just say, Heavenly Father, I trust you to forgive me, to change me, to make me new. Jesus, be first in my life, my Lord and my Savior. Save me by your grace. Fill me with your spirit so I can follow you and live for you for the rest of my life. My life is not my own. I give it to you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. If you just prayed that prayer, welcome into the family of God. What an awesome decision to give your life to Christ. Today's a new day. Please let us know that you made that decision. Click the link because we want to help you grow in your new relationship with the Lord and help you grow. I hope you have a great rest of the week. Let's be people with jaws of life. Our words are powerful.